Kia ora and good morning, everyone. Welcome to this ANZ Agri Insights webinar. I'm Mark Greenside, uh, the Regional Manager at ANZ New Zealand. Look, today I'm delighted to be joined by ANZ's agricultural economist, who will be well known, Susan Killsby, and Erica Van Reenen, Managing Director of Ag First Manawatu Whanganui and Chair at Ag First. Our focus today, with Susan and Erica's help, is to have a look at what's happening in the economy across the agri sector and what agri businesses can do to look at how they improve the environmental outcomes, including options for mitigating greenhouse gases and emissions. So as a bank, we've been supporting farmers and their communities for over 150 years. In fact, attended the Century Farms in Lawrence over the weekend saw many people who shared their long stories of success and resilience. This resilience shown by our agri businesses customers is truly remarkable. We see it on a daily basis, and we'd just like to acknowledge the efforts and intelligence that's going into running these businesses through these times. Climate change and the need for environmental resilience are a growing part of our conversations with customers. That's why we're committed to delivering insights like this webinar. Looking to the future, ANZ is a key contributor to the framework being designed under the Sustainable Agricultural Finance Initiative to accelerate investment and support for sustainable agriculture in New Zealand. We are committed to growing our expertise and we'll be on this journey with you. As the sector collaborates and considers the benefits of sustainable finance, the key focus will be finding the ability for farming to achieve all the different outcomes of environmental, social and economic prosperity. The world needs to be fed, as well as being better protected from the impacts of what's coming through climate change. And one message I would share at the outset is that we all see how we're all in this together. Businesses throughout the economy, banks included, are navigating all these new practices and we'll have to put in place a response to climate change. We will be here with you. Now, to give you some insights into what's happening in the economy, I'd like to hand over to Susan. Welcome, Susan. Hello, everyone. So um, today, um, what I'm going to talk to you um, about is a little bit about what we're seeing happening in the economy right now, um, and then um, what's happening in terms of um, different product prices um, and the likes, and um, we'll, we'll head on through. So I guess the big... Um, the big picture trends that we're seeing at the moment, um, both here in New Zealand and, and globally, um, are really around inflation. Um, costs have gone, you know, skyrocketed, um, not just here, but in most countries around the world. And um, so we're in a period where we are seeing monetary policy tightening, interest rates rising um, as we try and um, battle, um, battle inflation. Some of the challenges that we saw um, through the pandemic, um, particularly some of our um, supply side um, logistical challenges, problems getting product to the market um, and the likes, um, have now um, sort of normalised. So we're no longer sort of battling um, on that front as much as what we were. We are still um, seeing pockets of um, political unrest. Um, China-US tensions um, remain, and um, that was reiterated at the recent um, sort of G3 summit, um, where there was also a lot of focus on what's um, what's happening in Ukraine um, as well. So, um, in, in in some ways, we've seen some improvement in the flow of of goods from um, from. Um, Ukraine, but um, it's still nowhere, um, still still causing some um, challenges as well. Um, I guess the other big trend that we're seeing is consumers are looking for more information about um, how their food is produced, not just the quality of, of the food that they're eating, um, but some of the ethics behind um, what um, the various ways um, food is, is being produced, um, and then a lot of um, a lot more focus on um, the environmental um, concerns as well. Um, but just touching on interest rates, because this has always been a, um, a real um, hot topic at the moment, um, we, we do see further tightening in the monetary um, policy cycle. So we um, do think we'll see the Reserve Bank lifting the official cash rate um, further. Um, our forecast is for another 25 basis points or a quarter of percent lift um, tomorrow at um, when they meet tomorrow and then another lift um, at, at the following um, meeting. Um, this graph kind of shows that there's differing views around how high rates need to go and how quickly they need to come back. Um, and there is still a lot of uncertainty. Um, but I, what I would say is that we don't feel we're at the top of the cycle quite yet. Um, and then, um, but we are, we are heading, we're, we're getting closer is probably the best way to um, put it at the moment. In terms of um, supply chain pressures, international um, 
indices that that measure some of these things are, are starting to normalize um, as a the shipping rates from an international basis. What we are seeing though is for our local shipping rates, getting goods in and out of New Zealand, it is still more expensive than what it was um, prior to the pandemic. Um, and that really just comes down to the number of um, ships plying, um, coming down to New Zealand um, and particularly down to our smaller ports. So still some challenges there. It's not quite as good as what it is on a global scale getting goods in and out of New Zealand, but certainly um, a lot cheaper than what we saw quite, um, you know, a few months back. Um, the other trend that we're seeing, we're seeing grain and oil um, um, prices both coming off. We see, so energy prices in general have, um, have come back after that big spike um, that we saw in, in pricing um, across the energy sector. Uh, at the time of the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine. So prices have, um, have definitely come off. Um, no matter what sort of type of um, energy we're we're talking about, um, fertilizer prices are also trending down. Um, not showing so much on this graph, but this is the imported price coming into New Zealand up to the end of last year was still trending up. Um, but certainly, we have seen some relief there. Um, but prices certainly not back to the levels that we saw um, prior to the pandemic. And one, one thing that has been working in our favour recently is the New Zealand dollar has been um, lower than what it would normally be relative to commodity prices. So here we've just got the dairy prices um, marked against the New Zealand dollar. And normally the New Zealand dollar would be um, would be um, a little bit higher um, if we were uh, in terms of its long run relationship with dairy prices. Um, but what we're seeing over the last few years is a lot of uncertainty in global markets and that, that uncertainty and that risk has driven um, down the New Zealand dollar. Um, so in that respect, we're actually getting a benefit um, at the farm gate level um, that the lower New Zealand dollar is actually returning higher prices um, for the goods that we are selling. Um, but then, of course, anything that we're importing, like our fertilizer and fuel, um, it has the opposite effect. So it makes them more expensive. Um, looking at where prices currently are um, for, for, for various sectors, so um, our forecast for the um, milk price um, for the current season sits at $8.25 for next season um, at $8.50. Um, and we, we do expect to see, to get to that $8.50, we do need to see commodity prices um, trend up over the next, um, or, or throughout the, throughout the season. Um, but it's not a it's not a massive lift that we need to see, but we do need to see them trending upward rather than downward to to get to that um, level. There is a huge range of pricing out there at the moment in terms of forecasts for next season, and and that certainly does reflect um, the uncertainty that you have at this time of the season, so early in the season, um, around where prices will actually um, end up at. In terms of our shape and beef sector, um, once again, this year we haven't seen as strong a prices um, for both beef and lamb as what we saw last season, um, but we are at the point now that prices are trending up um, in the international market, and we also have seen some a little bit of upward movement in, um, in schedule prices here as well. Um, quite unusual for the for um, beef prices um, to be going up at this time of the year when there's a lot of stock um, heading through the processes. Um, I mean, the, the volume of lamb going through is, is considerably less at the moment, um, and so processes are having to look a little bit harder for that for those um, um, for finished lambs at at the moment. Um, but certainly, there's plenty of um, plenty of cattle coming um, through. So um, we did see some quite strong pricing in these two sectors um, in across um, last season, um, and it. it they both have been significantly and sort of impacted by those lockdowns that happened in China earlier on this year. Um, as it, you know, um, China is now, um, well, it's now as big a market for beef as, as the US is. Um, and it's certainly our, by far our largest market for mutton um, and also um, one of our biggest markets for lamb as well. So that, that has had quite an impact, but we are seeing prices um, in the international markets trending up at the moment. So, um, so that is positive. Obviously, some of the challenges is really around um, the costs, just how quickly costs have risen. So while you know you look at those um, historic farm gate prices and they look at reasonable levels, um, fully understand that these costs have, have risen very rapidly on farm, um, particularly in more intensive farming operations. 
and um, that is really squeezing margins um, at the moment. If we look at um, debt within, um, within our primary sector, um, the overall debt levels um, has eased slightly, but um, it's relatively stable in the last few years. But we have seen um, quite a drop um, in the dairy debt levels. So um, as we've seen more um, principal repayments in that sector, um, sheep and beef has stayed relatively stable across, um, across that period. Um, but we've seen quite a, quite a lot of growth um, in the horticulture sector, um, particularly in, um, in kiwi fruit um, and to a lesser extent um, in the likes of um, avocados. Um, in terms of uh, some of the focus that we're talking about today is focusing on the environment and Erica will um, dive into this um, into greater detail. Um, there is a lot of change happening in the sector in terms of um, what consumers are looking for. Consumers are becoming much more um, aware of, um, of how food is produced and are looking for a lot more of those softer values around, um, around some of the around the way the food is produced rather than just the actual um, product um, they are eating. Um, and we are also seeing um, a lot of change in terms of regulations, um, um, both here in New Zealand and, and internationally. Um, there's been you know, quite a focus on, on managing nutrient emissions, keeping our, our water um, quality high. That's, um, while that is a challenge in some other countries around the world, it's certainly probably more of a domestic issue um, than say the greenhouse gas emissions, which is very much a global issue and top of mind for sort of consumers all, um, all around, around the world. The other change that we're seeing at the moment is, um, or there's quite a lot of change happening in regulations, but the emission trading scheme is being reviewed as well at the moment. So we've seen carbon prices fall quite sharply um, this year, and um, the whole scheme is currently sort of under review in terms of how um, forestry is treated um, within that scheme. So at the moment, um, forestry is net, um, sequestration from forestry can be netted off against gross emissions, um, which is quite unusual for a, um, a global emissions trading scheme. Um, most, most of the schemes just focus on reducing gross emissions or reducing pollution rather than having the ability to offset um, against um, sequestration. So um, certainly one, one to watch in terms of where that's, um, where that's trending. Um, the other area we're still waiting to get more details on, of course, is, is the um, Hewakari Kanoa or how ag is going to be priced into the scheme. Um, and Erica will speak more about that. But um, but certainly, you know, with agriculture accounting for half of our emissions, um, and our greenhouse gas emissions, um, there, you know, we're definitely going to be accounting for it one way or the other. It's just how and when we do that. That's still um, still a little bit up in the air. And so in terms of um, sort of summarising where we're seeing things, um, we are seeing tighter global economic conditions um, in most countries around the world. China is probably the only country this year that will actually um, have stronger economic growth than, than it did last year. Um, every other country is sort of easing, easing back. Um, so that is, um, that is creating you know, some challenges um, in terms of um, demand for, for goods. Um, it does tend to you know, ease back when... when um, everyone's under a bit of economic pressure. Um, we are st seeing, you know, some some easing in our energy costs in, in general. So that's sort of being reflected in, in softer um, prices for for the likes of um, fertilizer and fuel. Um, we're still seeing interest rates trending up as um, as we try and get on top of that inflation problem. Um, and labor availability is still, you know, reasonably challenging um, across. Um, well, I guess across most sectors, but particularly in um, particularly in the primary sectors. And while we have really low unemployment levels, it's quite challenging um, to get inflation under control as well, because we're seeing you know a lot of upwards pressure on on wages from from that sector. So um, it's certainly you know not a quick fix. We've got a wee bit of pain ahead of us um, in terms of um, in terms of the economy. I'm um, looking further ahead, um, you know, the global um, resources for food production are limited and um, th there's been a greater focus on, um, on sustainable production. I mean, one, one advantage we have here in New Zealand is we do have access, we do have plenty of water. Um, some of us have had far too much water um, this year on our, on our farms, but um, 
we do lack water storage in New Zealand, so that's um, one area we will need to focus on if we want to actually take advantage of that natural resource that we have in abundance that very few other countries um, do, do have. Um, to get higher returns for our products, you know, we're going to have to supply more information about how we produce um, our, our goods in New Zealand, and that, that information needs to get through the supply chain so, so consumers um, can understand um, um, the sustainable, um, I guess, virtues of our products. Um, and, and the other thing I think we'll see a, a big change in over the next decade or so is, is a much bigger variation in the farm gate prices that we will each receive. Um, and that will depend not just on what we're selling at the gate, but how, how we're producing that. Um, and also, you know, taking into consideration environmental aspects, also welfare aspects, animal welfare, um, how well we're treating our staff, all of those types of things are gonna be important and we will see differentials um, as a result of that. I will finish there. We do have, um, if you do want to get hold of um, any of our products, we do have a couple of codes that um, we, will, we will distribute out um, and feel free to ask any. Um, sure, everyone, um, really nice to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, how you and your farming business can prepare for some of the changes and Susan's done a great job of um, setting up what, um, what we're kind of facing and I'll just go into a little bit more detail on on those aspects. Um, I think important to uh, highlight what the definition of sustainability is when you're, when you're talking about it. So for me, I use the Brundtland definition, uh, which is um, that sustainable development is development that meets the needs of, without compromising the ability of future needs to meet their own, future generations to meet their own needs. So from 1987, been around for a long time, I guess when you think about what that might mean, um, identifying needs is obviously very subjective and we all have a different view of what needs are both now and what might uh, needs might be in the future. Um, we don't have crystal balls uh, working just yet, but you know time will time will tell on that one. Um, so I, I guess it's thinking about how we what we using what we know and operating within that kind of environment. A farm business is land, water, people, animals, as well as the business aspects. Um, and so, and we're also part of a community as farmers, uh, be that local, uh, within our farm teams, and the wider local community, regions, nationally, and of course, we're part of a global ecosystem as well. Um, and each of those uh, layers will have different needs and expectations of what we do. I'm going to focus on the environmental aspects of um, sustainability, but um, but acknowledge that it is not all about environment. That's just one aspect of sustainability. Um, so as, as Susan's highlighted, we are in a very uh, rapidly changing world at the moment. Um, customer expectations are changing probably at a greater rate than what consumers are at this stage. So customers are working really hard ahead of uh, consumer expectations. Having said that, there's some really exciting um, opportunities coming through markets, and I know a number of, um, of meat companies at the moment are, are offshore working quite hard on our behalf. So it is important to understand that it, this is uh, the customer level, so the people that are buying our product um, before it goes to the consumer, in, um, and that's often driving things. We're also seeing financial markets changing, so all of the Bank Zealand have signed up to the Sustainable Agricultural Finance Initiative, and um, you'll see green loans coming through or sustainability linked loans, um, and ANZ of course are doing that as well. And so this is driving things on top of what we're um, potentially going to see very soon in regulation or we've already seen. So rapidly changing nature of farming. And if you even go 10, 15 years ago, we could operate more or less within the farm gate and buy to our own devices, that um, that's no longer business as usual. Um, I often hear when I'm out and about that um, that this is all happening at once and, and it's really hard to deal with. I'm a farmer too and um, absolutely feels like this is coming at us like a freight train. Um, it is in terms of how things are landing, this is in the regulatory space, but I guess just to highlight that none of this stuff is new. So the Climate Change Response Act with ETS and it was enacted in 2008 and prior to that was 2002 when it was it came into legislation. 
for the first time since then pretty much every government has um, has made changes to it so it's changing and evolving um, all the time national policy statement for fresh water was 2011 uh, we had the national policy statement for fresh water management 2020 uh, we've still got a proposed national policy statement for indigenous biodiversity which we're waiting for some certainty around what that might look like um, and of course, we've got emissions pricing or the ETS coming at us in 2025. Um, it, within all of those bits, there's elements that we've had to deal with and a lot of that has fallen in the last couple of years, um, hence why we're, we're feeling quite under, under pressure and overwhelmed in our farming um, environment. It's hurting and it's hurting rural New Zealand um, and we are, um, we're showing that hurt. Uh, uh, understandably so. Um, there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there. Um, there's a lot of uh, challenge coming at us. Um, it, there's a cultural shift happening where our identity is being threatened. I know for us, we identify as, as being sheep and beef farmers. Um, thinking about could we be any other type of farmers is a really challenging thing to get your brain around. Um, a lot of this stuff is complex, complex and it's also counter to what we've done previously so we're having to shift the way we think about our farming systems what metrics we're using what matters what we do to drive uh, profitable outcomes might actually be counter to some of these environmental components that we've been asked to um, respond to and even though it's been coming at us for a long time the pace of change we're dealing with is is substantial and that's hard we have been here before so this is um, farmers protesting uh, subsidy in the 80s um, in Wellington and um, and I am yet to meet a farmer that would say we should go back to being a subsidised um, farm at rural economy or an economy at all, at all that's subsidised. We uh, went through a lot of pain um, in the subsidy removals um, and uh, definitely uh, think there could be could have been things done a lot better in terms of how the policy was structured to support transition and hopefully we're not going to face the same kind of pressures this time around but we did thrive as a result of the subsidy removal and so I guess my challenge to you is to think about the change we're seeing now um, in relation to how we can overcome that and see it as an opportunity and, and capture the opportunity that's there. And um, just to, I'll quickly go over this just because um, Susan's already covered it but when I'm talking about environmental aspects we're talking about fresh water that's both quality and quantity. Um, I won't spend much time on that because we've um, there's been a lot of um, a lot of talk about that. Um, indigenous biodiversity. Um, if you talk to um, to companies who are operating in the market, it's becoming a really global hot topic. Globally, there's massive decline in biodiversity. New Zealand's no different. We're losing species rapidly. Uh, that's vegetation. Um, and, and fauna as well. Um, so we're, you know, we've a game up there, but we've also got an opportunity because of the amount of um, indigenous biodiversity in our farming system. So if we can protect and enhance, look after what's there already, we've got some um, great gains that can be made. It can't all be put onto the um, the crown to protect what they've got with the little resource they have. So that's a watch the space and there's certainly some potential opportunities coming into the market with biodiversity. Climate change, um, I've, I've separated out climate change and greenhouse gases in this presentation um, because we need to be thinking not just about how we reduce our emissions or how, we, how we're going to respond to emissions pricing, but also how the climate is changing and what that will mean for our farming systems. Um, as many of you will be aware, basically New Zealand's emissions are a drop in the bucket in, in terms of the global ecosystem that we're in. Um, we are very much at the mercy of what happens out in the world. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do our bit, but it does mean that our climate is going to change as a result of what the collective um, globe does to reduce emissions or not. Um, so, so obviously we've seen some horrendous um, natural disasters in the last couple of years in particular, uh, we're likely to see more of that. We need to be prepared for that as much as we can. And that's not just at, um, behind the farm gate, but we're going to need some bigger strategies um, to handle some of these big large scale disasters. Also thinking about what changes might be coming my way 
that are incremental and slow um, as the climate warms. So we're already seeing things like facial eczema come into the northern parts of the South Island, um, just as, as that temperature shifts and, um, and things evolve. Um, we see changes like that, the type nature of, um, of pasture species, um, what impacts that might have on our stock, et cetera. Um, so thinking about those two things a bit separately. And then of course, greenhouse gases um, around uh, our need to reduce those as, as is legislated, um, our need to reduce those for potentially for market um, claims that we might be making zero carbon, net carbon zero, uh, low carbon, et cetera. Um, and, and as well as in, um, in regulation or opportunities with sustainable finance. This with greenhouse gases is on farm, we're talking about methane and nitrous oxide. Methane is directly driven by feed eaten. So the more feed we eat, the more methane we put out. It's pretty much a one-to-one -one relationship. Other, a couple of other factors that drive emissions, quality of feed, um, not, so nitrogen content of feed, um, and not, amount of nitrogen fertilizer used. So those are the three things. If we can alter those in our farm system, we can reduce them emissions, the challenge to us as farmers is how do we reduce emissions while still remaining profitable? And at the moment, there's not heaps of options to do that. Farmers who are already ahead of the game uh, in terms of really efficient systems, low stocking rate, high individual animal performance, don't have a whole lot of room to move. Um, and the technology options that are coming at us are, are there, but they're not there yet. So we don't have those ready to roll out and potentially they're going to be quite expensive when they do hit. So it's it, we need to think about all of these things in the context of our broader farm system. How do we address all of these things uh, while still supporting our people and our animals and making a dollar at the end of it? So just a, a bit of a quick, I guess, a, a build up, if you like, of, of kind of what we know and the environment that we're in at the moment. So this is hopefully a little bit of help to think about um, change coming at us. So in terms of base, what we're going to have to all deal with, the um, continuation of pressure around resource management, um, expectations around how we use shared resources such as water. So you, you know, we'll see that continued um, consents for land use, for irrigation effluent, rules around waste disposal, etc. So those are there right now. Every district, every region has rules around that. Depending on the farm system you're operating, you'll be you'll be regulated to some um, some level with the way that you farm. If we go level up and, and we talk about what's come at us in, in recent times or about to hit us, we've now got rules around intensive winter grazing and, um, and consents required if you meet a certain threshold. There's stock exclusion rules um, coming at us, to, again, depending on, on what sort of system you're running and, um, and slope. Um, very soon, we're expecting the regulations to drop for certified freshwater farm plans. So every farm farmer in will need a certified freshwater farm plan. Um, that is uh, yet to be seen in terms of the detail of that, and that's going to be rolled out regionally. So it won't be the whole country all at once, um, but they'll be starting with um, two or three regions and then rolling that out progressively. Hopefully that means we're, um, we're ironing out some of the kinks as we go. But that's big, and it's going to be something that if you've got to do it, do it really well and think about how you can turn then into more than just a tick box exercise. What else can you build around that plan that might help you tackle some of these other challenges? While that plan's got to be have a freshwater focus, you can use it for other elements of managing your resources. And then, as I said, emissions pricing. What we know with that uh, is still waiting for some final decisions uh, to come through from Cabinet. Um, the, the government reported back in December, if you missed it, it's called a Section 215 report and on the MFE website. Um, sorry, I should have popped it up in, in the chat um, and to the link to it, but have a read of that. That will set out what happens come 2025. All farmers will be paying for their emissions at the farm level um, and there's, there's a bunch of rules around what that might look like. We don't know what the price is going to be yet uh, and as I said, there's a bunch of detail around that um, I, which I talked about in the last session um, if, you, if you want to go back to that. 
Um, and again, so we've, you know, we've got market-led assurance schemes, sustainable finance coming through. So there are expectations broader than just the regular um, regulation. In terms of what's now normal, we're seeing increased climate volatility. We've obviously got increased market volatility and you're well, well supported here with Susan giving great insights into where the market's at. Change is the normal. Um, we, we are seeing change of basis in every aspect of what we do is in our farming business. Um, and the expectations of, of those beyond the farm gate influencing what we do is also the normal. So I guess just to give you a few pointers on where to start, um, use this or not if it doesn't work for you, but um, a key thing I see with farmers who are well positioned to tackle this is the mindset. If you're in a negative mindset about this, you're fighting it, you're resisting it, you're up in misinformation, not thinking about the sources of information coming at you, um, the the way that you will think about these challenges is not a constructive one to build a good, profitable, strong business that can evolve and seek opportunities or make the most of opportunities when they come. So I uh, so really encourage you to take a constructive mindset with this stuff. That doesn't mean I'm saying it's easy It's and, and that we're not going to be challenged by it or pissed off by it, or that you shouldn't contribute constructively to policy discussions because we absolutely need to do that. Um, we really need good regulation that works for farmers that can be implemented. Um, but your mindset is your, is your first tool, I guess, um, in tackling all of this. Be informed and also be careful of your information sources. There is a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of, um, of reasons that people are putting out misinformation. So just be careful about how you're getting your information from. Have a strategy, so take, take a strategic approach to this. You can't, if you start diving into all the different aspects that you've got to respond to, you can, can definitely miss some of the bigger picture or miss some of the um, efficiencies that can be made by responding to some of these challenges with one action dealing with multiple issues. Then apply that into your operational planning um, and be prepared to change. So um, I, I farmers say well, we're going to wait until we have certainty before we do the next thing. Um, there's certain aspects that we're going to have to wait for, like in terms of responding to freshwater farm plan rules, for example. Um, but there's a bunch of things that are going to be no regrets. Having a good, solid farm environment plan is a really good basis for tackling a bunch of these things, and you can build on it as we get more certainty. So be prepared to change and, um, and just Start taking action. Elephants, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Um, just a little framework that might be useful for you um, that I, I use from a strategic perspective. So always, always start with what your business and family goals and objectives are. So um, every business is different. You've got different structures, different um, goals, different positions in terms of where you're at with succession. You might have just come through succession. You might be still going through succession. You might be planning to sell the farm in a few years. All of these things matter and will make a difference to the type of actions you take to address some of these challenges. So once you're clear on what your goals and objectives are, identify what your resources are and the constraints you've got within those. So that's your natural resources, your human resources, and your capital resources. All of those things kind of set your boundary. Um, you, I'm, I'm not going to be suddenly dairy farming on my whole country farm. Um, on my flat farm, I've got options in terms of land use just because of the nature of the uh, resource we've got there. So you've got options depending on the, the land and the water resource that you've got, but you'll also be constrained with location, with people, and also, of course with capital. So that kind of sets your boundaries. Constraints also think about those things. So you'll have regulatory constraints potentially. Um, it's very hard to, for example, go from dairy to horticulture as a land use change, uh, quite easy to go from sheep and beef into forestry, it would appear. So those sorts of land use decisions will be um, driven in part by, by policy. So understanding those constraints, but also your natural environment constraints. There's some beautiful soils in Awakuni that can grow some great vegetables, but there's only a certain number of vegetables they can grow because they're climate constrained. So those physical um, environmental constraints need to be considered. 
So those two things kind of set your parameters, your business and family um, goals and objectives and your resources and constraints. And then you can look at how do I think about my business uh, taking all of those things into consideration? What are my opportunities? Is, is the way I'm farming my land now meeting those goals and objectives? Um, are there other opportunities that I might be able to pursue? And I'm not talking about everyone changing land use here. This is just um, thinking about you might be able to make in the system um, as well as uh, broader opportunities that might exist for you. That gives you a way of coming up with an in integrated strategic response. And it means that you're considering multiple facets at the same time. Um, you might need supplementary plans to support this. Most integrated farm plans that I've seen are very beastly documents. Um, great if you're into a seriously large document. If you're not, make sure you're putting an output, having a plan that you will implement. So it might be a map that goes up on the shed wall um, that you're engaging with on a regular basis. I'll just touch on some of the opportunities out there. Um, as I said, thinking about bang for buck. So how do you tackle multiple opportunities at once? Um, great example, I'm currently down in Middlemarch at the moment and, and a farm here um, had a um, quite a large gully system uh, that was once a wetland. Um, they've looked at retiring that wet, uh, wetland, so putting it back into the wetland, planting up the sides. It was a mission to muster. Uh, it's the sheep and, sheep and cattle farm. Um, and so they've, but they've planted in a way that they can put that planting into the ETS. They've restoring the wetland, they've also made management easier. So moving stock um, through that area is now way easier than it used to be. And so all of that provides um, one, one action, which is not insignificant in terms of undertaking that, that action, but is achieving multiple objectives. It's supporting water quality outcomes. It's bringing back some biodiversity into the wetland ecosystem. It's giving them some carbon and it's made management easy. So it's is thinking about multiple things at once. Um, using that, that strategic framework to think about, is your current land use right? If there's things that you're doing that you think, oh, I probably shouldn't be doing that, you probably shouldn't. That's, you know, your gut's telling you that it's probably not the right thing to be doing. So can you do better with less animals? Can you improve your per animal performance to achieve the same outcomes for profit and reduce your emissions and your, your um, nutrient losses out of the system, as an example. Is your bank offering uh, green finance? Um, are there, can you get some um, interest rate reductions or low interest loans for some of the work that you wanna do to achieve some of these objectives? That's always a good place to start. Um, is your processor offering any premiums for doing this work? Most of the processors do have programs now and there, there are some opportunities for premiums. I will say on premiums, it's not a given. Um, most of this stuff is just going to be uh, about keep maintaining our market access, potentially allowing us into new markets. Um, we can't expect a premium on it. The, the nature of the consumer is such that this is, this is expected now. Um, technology will be coming and it can help. And we've seen um, quite, a, quite a shift in the way technology can help um, with our understanding and also with some tackling some of these challenges. So being up to date on what's coming at us um, around technology, mitigation practices, um, it is really useful. And uh, if you have a look at, at agmatters.nz, that's a great place to, to get the latest on greenhouse gas mitigation research, um, case studies of farmers doing good things, where the science is at around uh, climate change in particular, but it's all written for farmers to access. So I encourage you to um, have a look at that website. Um, and just, uh, I guess, to be a bit provocative, um, thinking about are you, are you a farmer who farms the type of stock or are you farming the land? And uh, is there a different way you could be farming? Um, if we think that we're land farmers, uh, maybe there are different, um, different things we would consider in our businesses that might help support those future generations' needs. Um, the other thing I guess that, that's important is that all of this is tough to tackle alone, like really tough to tackle alone. It's a lot. Um, if you can work with other farmers who are going through the same challenges, um, that, that is really um, 
generally a really positive way of dealing with it. Um, I'm, I'm down here in Middlematch with a group of farmers tackling the challenge of reducing emissions. Um, it, catchment groups are doing great things around water quality, uh, starting to think about climate change as well. I know not everyone likes to work in a group environment and, um, and I know a lot of farmers, are, um, part of their preference for farming is that they don't have to talk to too many people. Um, but if there are ways that you can get together, even if it's just your wider farm team, your, your bank, your accountant, your vet, your neighbour, um, whoever it might be, talking about this stuff with more than just um, what's going on up here is, is really important. Um, it's also, most of it is, is not just uh, defined by a property boundary. So we're talking about catchment scale or planetary scale uh, change that's required. Um, and so managing things like biodiversity outcomes or greenhouse gases at a broader scale than just our, um, the confines of our property boundaries will make a much bigger impact um, with potentially less input. Um, and use your team, I guess. So, so um, you know, our young people and uh, are coming into the sector um, really passionate about solving some of these challenges. So don't underestimate um, how your farm teams are positioned to help you think about these things. Um, so yeah, it, you know, um, I guess just to summarise, um, we we do need to recognise the broad role of livestock beyond um, climate change and water and biodiversity. Um, we do produce food and nutrition. And we've got we have livelihoods. We have roles in terms of nutrient cycling, carbon storage, biodiversity, landscape design. Um, and maintenance, but we're also caring for an ecosystem and an environment. So we need to try and uh, work together to figure out how to do both. Um, we need farmers in the farming community working together and not trying to divide. Um, it's not going to be easily solved by individuals. And there's plenty of arguments that we can have around how we tackle these challenges. Uh, sometimes we're just going to have to get on and give things a crack and, and see what happens. Um, we can't, we're not going to get away with inaction, so we do need to do something. Um, if we are doing it, we can um, we can find the opportunities and um, be part of both the um, the problem and the solution. So I'll leave it there and hand back to Mark. Well, thanks very much, Susan, and thanks very much, Erica. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes to run or thereabouts. Uh, and so, you know, it's gonna be important that we can get um, people's questions. And there's a few questions that have been submitted, but look, there's a, there's a really big picture there around what's happening in New Zealand agriculture and certainly from an economic perspective uh, as well as, I think uh, a big part of what Eric has shared with us is the, the leadership um, that's required, the sort of mindset that's required to work out where you're at and where you need to go. And, you know, the ability to connect or get off farm or do these sort of things in terms of these um, webinars to keep yourself informed and what I tend to find when I'm out and about dealing in the ag sector is, you know, where people are getting um, informed and aware, then they seem to find a way to get, go forward and, and, and have a plan for the, for the future. So, uh, yeah, well done for everybody that's attended today and, and for those people that um, can see their way through um, and then have got good people around them. Just as we start those questions, uh, I've got one for you, Susan, to, to kick off. Uh, one around interest rate forecast and when and if they start stabilising and reducing and where do you think they will land uh, in particular? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, what we're expecting is interest rates to um, more upwards pressure on interest rates for the next few months um, and then to basically stabilise at high levels um, right through until the second half of 2024. Um, before then starting starting to come back again. And we have been through a period recently, you know, um, um, where we've had interest rates at incredibly low levels. So we're unlikely to get back down to those really, really low levels because um, essentially they, they aren't sustainable either in, in, in the longer term. So, um, yeah, exactly where that lies. I, I couldn't tell you exactly that number that we're going to get to um, in the future. Um, but, you know, it'll be somewhere between where we are today um, and then, you know, somewhat some relief from that, but not necessarily down to those really incredibly low levels that we saw either. Thanks, Susan. One for you, Erica. Uh, when you think about the future of farming, what role do you see genetics, both pasture and animal, playing in the sector? 
Yeah, really good question. Um, so uh, we do we do have the ability to um, purchase um, low emissions rams now. So um, so the Greenhouse Gas Research Centre started developing that program um, quite some time ago, and they've had a they've run a low emission and high emission sheep flock for for several years now. Um, and and beef and lamb genetics have now taken that on and um, and a starting to test rams around the country. So, um, so definitely, and in the um, dairy dairy industry, LOC and um, CRV and breed are both um, going hard to um, to try and um, establish similar in the dairy industry, which will hopefully also flow through to beef. Um, so, so definitely genetics for um, for emissions. It's it's going to get us a bit of the way there, but it's not going to get us all of the way there. Um, I, I'm I'm reading between the line guessing there was an element of is GE part of the solution here um, in that question. Um, so I think, um, I and, and from my perspective, the science on climate change, 99% of scientists agree that it, it's a problem and humans are causing it. Um, as I understand it, the science around genetic, um, genetic modification is at a similar level of, of consensus uh, that it doesn't harm, doesn't create um, um, the challenge is an ethical one uh, in terms of how we respond to that. So I would say I hope so uh, in, in terms of both feed and animals. And it's pretty hard to see how we can um, keep doing what we're doing without a solution like genetics um, and genetics that's shifting well beyond the incremental change we need. Um, but political will, ethics, uh, market opportunities, I've getting thrown around there that you know we may have a market advantage by being GE free um all of those things that are, uh, are complex and um and difficult to say so uh, my my view is I hope so um there's there's certainly scope there but yeah we'll um it will require a bit of leadership okay great look um the next one there is around um carbon forestry uh, in particular What's your hunch regarding the future for exotic carbon forestry? And Susan, you might have a crack first. Yeah, well, we, I mean, at the moment, we're seeing a review of the ATS, um, and it's become quite clear um, that the current system isn't sustainable, um, how, it, how it is. Um, what it's really encouraging is um, a lot of forestry planting, um, but not necessarily creating the right incentives to actually reduce um, pollution to meet our longer term targets. So it's a bit of a band-aid, a short, a short term fix. So I think we will see some changes in that ETS to, um, to encourage a reduction of gross um, emissions and um, less reliance on, on forestry. Exactly how that comes out is, is yet, yet to be known, um, but I suspect we will see something that makes um, I guess the current imbalance between natives and forestry not quite, I mean, natives and pines not quite as great as what we're currently currently seeing. Um, but it's certainly one we're watching pretty closely and there should be some more info on this um, probably in June. So um, one to watch. Okay, and a little bit on the same subject uh, in regard to that, and I'll do my best to um, represent the, the question Accurately. So Erica, can you comment on offsetting? How do we get the same recognition as a company who donates one tree for a purchase, then they talk about being carbon zero, yet I can plant natives and receive no recognition unless it is, unless it is the size, uh, unless it is of the size 30 square metres. This is a flat farm with some small unproductive area, not like a large gully like your middle march. Often the offsetting company gets the kudos not the landowners? Yeah, it's a really good question. And offsetting's um, a really uh, complex and um, uh, challenging area. Again, a lot of this stuff, the reason it's hard, it's technical, it's political, it's ethically quite tricky. So um, so offsetting is one of those areas where, um, where there is increasing scrutiny and you'll see a lot of the um, the pressure on companies or the accusations of greenwashing and by and large that's against offsetting as a practice so I think we'll see more global uh, rules in, in potentially market regulation around offsetting even being an option um, for, for companies and Susan sort of alluded to that too D 
domestically. Um, what I will say though is that through the um, the proposed emissions pricing um, under Kawaki Ekenoa and what the government has responded with, um, small areas of planted or regenerated native will be recognised. We just don't know the full detail around that, but for smaller areas like your 30 metre squared area, that would get credit um, of some description under under the emissions pricing as proposed. So, um, so I think there's there is some scope there, uh, and the and the voluntary market is creating some opportunity um, for for that. I know some meat companies are, are utilising uh, some offsets on farm um, as part of the supply chain and paying farmers directly for that. Um, and and so is um, so are some of the milk companies. So there are opportunities there. Um, it, but it's I would I just say fire be we are a little bit that um, there is international pressure um, for offsetting not to be an option. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks, Erica. Uh, look, one there just before uh, we start to think about getting towards the end there, Susan, just thinking about your predictions for 2024 dairy payouts and the lamb and beef schedule, you sort of touched on it a wee bit in your uh, your your slides, but do you want to just comment a bit more about what that future state looks like and what's sitting behind that? Yeah, so I guess in terms of um, in terms of the dairy price and the milk price, um, some of what we're currently seeing is um, we are seeing some improvement in, in global demand for, for dairy, and particularly now that China's um, you know lockdowns have finished, and and so that market is sort of typically buying sort of similar levels of product to what they what they normally do at this at this time of the season. What we haven't seen was that big spike in buying that we normally see in January and February from that market. So there was a chunk of demand that just didn't happen earlier on um, earlier on this year. So, but we are starting to see a little bit of a more of a normalizing of, of demand there. We're seeing a little bit of an increase in, in global milk supplies. Um, so that is putting a little bit of pressure um, on pricing, but we are, we're sort of getting past that Northern Hemisphere peak period. Um, and we're not seeing any really any growth coming out of the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so we're not expecting massive, massive additional volumes of milk. So um, Supply and demand relatively balanced, um, and we are expecting to see some trend upward trend in pricing, just a steady upward trend from what is what has been like relatively um, low levels over over the next um, next twelve months. Um, in terms of um, in terms of both lamb and beef, um, our beef markets have really benefited over the last few years. Um, from having sort of two big markets to sell to, so we're now selling similar quantities of beef into um, into the US um, as as we do to China. Um, or well, um, you, the US used to be our big market. China was a very small market. Now they're similar sized markets for us, um, and that that is, that's really helped um, sort of diversify our, our market there a little bit. Um, we're seeing some improved demand for lamb. It's probably lamb's probably not as doing as well as beef, um, relatively speaking, because um, it is a, tends to be a higher price protein. So some of the higher price goods are struggling more in the current global economic climate that, that we're currently seeing. Um, so we're not seeing the strength in pricing that we saw a year ago um, this season, but we are seeing some improvements um, and definitely you know, upward trending prices in market. So um, some positivity there sort of behind, um, behind the scenes. Um, and at the same time, starting to see um, I guess the upward pressure on pricing is starting to dissipate um, in terms of costs as well. So um, yeah, definitely, definitely improving, but um, a little way to go yet. Okay, thanks. Look, there's a question here. Uh, it says, are banks still supportive of the farming sector? Uh, look, I think you know, there's a couple of ways of answering that. Well, I've been in the business of lending money to farmers for 25 years. There's, it's, there's probably never been more people on the ground doing this uh, all around New Zealand for banks, and that's all banks. And you know, there's a, there's a big prize here. Obviously, um, you know, banks in New Zealand understand a couple of things. You know, one is that there's about forty billion dollars of export earnings, or nearly sixty three percent of all export goods, you know, uh, driven out of the the ag economy. And you know, they pay the taxes and bring the jobs that are you know uh, locally, regionally. And so, if we want to support local and small businesses or agri businesses, the commercial businesses. We know that uh, that's what really exists in those local towns, and, and so the farm sector really is becomes the backbone of that. I think the other thing is that um, you know we've all looked at and know that 
to be future ready, there's going to be a whole lot more requirement to have more financial stability. So there's a lot more education and thinking about the financial literacy, uh, the education around that. Um, obviously, we talked a lot today about you know the environment. Um, but, and I think you know what it means is we will bring seminars like this to our customers, but equally we have to educate our bankers hugely now. So we just have to keep thinking about how you modernize and recruit people that are you know, relevant and get ourselves associated with those industries, et cetera, that are participating in the space. So yeah, lot, lots to do, um, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, banks today about $60 billion out the door to the ag sector. And um, that's the biggest wholesale lend, uh, you know, for any banks, um, you know, in, in any of their lending. So I think, um, I think there's, you know, the banks are very supportive. They see it as a very long-term play and it's just certainly managing our way through these things right now that um, are going to determine a lot about how that uh, future plays out. So uh, I don't think there's uh, any more specific questions, uh, but uh, I think what we'll do is we'll, I'm just having a look to see if there is. There was just one around what regions are um, certified freshwater farm plans are rolling out to first. So um, that Waikato and Southland will be the first caps off the rank this year. Um, yeah, and we're still waiting to hear who'll be next. It was meant to be um, Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, but obviously since um, Hale and Gabrielle, were, um, they've, they've been postponed for obvious reasons. Great. Well, look, I think we'll um, bring this to a close. It's been uh, a very uh, you know, informative session. There's been a lot that uh, you probably need to take in. And uh, from here, I think as we close our webinar, I'd like to encourage you to be have a go away and have a reflect about your own sort of long-term priorities and, and objectives in your business. Understand your current and future borrowing needs, uh, particularly around the space. Uh, because look, you know, what we really do, you know, not just with what the economic environment is, but certainly things we've touched on today, it's going to be really important that people are proactive and have real conversations with the people in their business and think you should be in that business today. That's helping you sort of navigate those things. You know, it's an opportunity to take really practical action to look at reducing your emissions and it's about understanding what's there and, and how you can do that. Um, look, for farming business wanting to improve their environmental outcomes, there are some um, things that's been touched on today, like the ANZ's business green loans, and they're available and they are at a special rate. And this is really a, a way in which we can help people um, identify, uh, you know, things and initiatives that can you know, make some things better on farm for eligible assets and projects. So there's, there's some detail that sits in behind that, but certainly feel like you can uh, come to our website or one of our managers to work through that. But look from here, a big thank you to our speakers, Erica and Susan. Thank you to everyone for taking the time to join us today.